Thank you. Uh, it's very nice to uh, see everyone here. So uh, it's a great pleasure to have uh, Eberhard Bodenschatz here tonight. Um, Eberhard did his uh, physics training through advanced degrees at the University of Bayreuth in uh, Germany. And uh, after that, he had a very important move. He came to UCSB here for a postdoc where he did uh, fantastic work in the, in the group of Gunther Ahlers, who, who's, who's there online. Can you say hello? Gunther is, is there watching this, uh, this talk, so it's, it's, it's great to have him. Uh, Eberhard has long association with uh, Cornell University, and then uh, moved to his present affiliation, which is this Institute for Dynamics and Self-Organization. I'll get back to that in a, in a minute. Uh, Eberhard is the leader of a group there in fluid dynamics, pattern formation, biocomplexity, and so on, which gives you a little bit of an idea of the work that he does, the areas of physics that uh, his, his work spans. Uh, he's been twice managing director of this uh, institute, and he will be again in 2023, he tells me. Uh, he has many connections with uh, KITP. So he was a uh, head of the chair of the advisory board for a period. Uh, he is a postdoc here, as I told you, and he has run several programs here over the years, which also gives you an idea of his interests. So 2000. And three, he ran a program, was an organizer or coordinator, we call them, of a program on pattern formation in physics and biology. Uh, remember that one? In 2006, he was an organizer of a mini program, Cardiac Dynamics. Oh, okay. And in 2011, organizer of a program on the nature of turbulence. And turbulence is one of the areas uh, that Eberhard has made extremely important contributions to throughout his career. In fact, of his many honors, I'll just mention the Stanley Corson Award of the American Physical Society in 2014 for innovative experimental techniques in uncovering a phenomena in turbulence. Um, but I think uh, for me, um, what's really uh, rewarding uh, to have Eberhard here and talking to him is just that every time I talk to him, it's something different and something fascinating. So besides all of this work that he's very well known for, I remember visiting him in Cornell when I was at Syracuse University and he was using heated wax to study tectonics or sea floor movement. Um, I remember standing on the balcony at um, an APS meeting in New Orleans when he was getting into studying clouds. And he was explaining to me, clouds are always sinking. And just uh, in the courtyard today before the talk, uh, he was telling me about bees organizing their hives and using uh, uh, cells, uh, very potent cells to differentiate and put inside the heart to regenerate a heart tissue. Uh, so I think uh, dynamics and self-organization describe Eberhardt perfectly, and it's a great pleasure to talk to us tonight about masks. Right. Well. Well, thank you. Thank you very much for having me. It's a real honor to be here. Um, so actually, I don't know whether you were at Alain Karma's talk on cardiac dynamics during the program in 2000 and when was it? Six, 26. So it was a very nice talk that he gave at the time. And so I hope uh, I can live up to your expectations somehow. Uh, I uh, The talk has a lot of slides, so but just feel free to interrupt at any given time and, you know, KITP standards also apply to me. Um, 
uh, since I give many talks nowadays on Zoom, I always make these little QR codes. So if you take your iPhone and later and you click on it, then you get to the respective websites automatically. So you don't have to take many notes here because I allow that. So this, this is, by the way, turbulence. Uh, this is the thing I will not talk about. This is the turbulence in a room, and you will see why this is interesting. It's fascinating. I, when I give a talk on cloud physics, I make actually a demonstration of exactly that phenomenon. It's beautiful. Uh, it's All it is, it's a laser that shines light into the room above your eyes so you don't get hurt, uh, like a pizza slice. And then you put in a little bit of discotheque smoke or theater smoke. That's it. And then I guarantee you, you will be mesmerized. You will sit there. There's a Swiss artist who's in doing this now. You know, he probably invented the music to it. So I, I wanted to do this with Brian Green in New York, but we never got to do it because he said, I have a component, somebody who makes music to this. It's amazing. You should try it out. Next time I come, I bring my laser with me and we can try it out. It's just really beautiful. It's really mesmerizing. But that's not what I'm talking about. <laughs> so what I'm talking about is masks and to understand the function of masks we have to understand quite a bit of physics on the way and i give you a tour of how we got into it what we got out of it i will talk about drops and aerosols so i will explain to you what we know about drops and aerosols or what i know and i've learned a lot um i knew nothing before corona came you uh, show that in a moment absolutely nil but I worked on clouds, and it turns out what I'm doing right now is basically rain, and so this is very close to clouds. Um, then what I, we have a little program that where you can calculate the risk of infection in a closed room based on the aerosols in the room. It's, you can download that and you can run it, and you can calculate out how long it takes until you have a chance of catching corona. Um, then we have measured masks. You know this guy here, right? So this is uh, me at 3D printed because we wanted to know whether we can mask. It turns out I'm on the norm, European Norming Commission or Standardization Commission for Infection Protection Masks. And this is my development towards a really good mask. Uh, not by face, of course, but um, we are on it. I, 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 at the end of the talk, if you have questions to that, I'm happy to answer. Otherwise, I run out a little bit of time. But there's a lot of things remain to be done. A lot of things, because all of us are wearing masks that were not meant for the purpose that you're wearing them. It's really true. There's no standard that tells you that what you're wearing makes sense. There's no standard that does a test of the protection you're trying to achieve. Everybody works on it right now. There's no good heads to test the standard. That's why this head was printed. Okay, and then I talk a little bit about wind instruments because during Corona, you know, while we're in the middle of it, uh, music playing was kind of strange. You couldn't go to the theater anymore. I would tell you it's actually quite safe. Um, it's not worse, so you shouldn't go to an opera. <laughs> if the singer has Corona, that would be not good for you. But otherwise, uh, like a good, you know, symphony with some, even bagpipes is fine. Um, but uh, so... So this is me being called into the university and I'm coughing and I'm coughing. A laser is shining right straight at me. I mean, this is a dangerous laser, five watts, but I have good goggles on, so nothing happens to me. Um, and I'm trying to do everything to get the air to move, right? You see that? I shout Tor, which is goal in Germany. And, and this was very important for the German soccer league because they wanted to know how dangerous it is in a German soccer stadium. They almost gave me money. That's so much. Um, just, just to tell you briefly, the German soccer league comes to you and says, don't you want to investigate how dangerous it is to be in a stadium in Berlin? Um, then they tell you, yes, uh, we give you 60,000 euros if you do an investigation in the soccer stadium in Berlin. Then you say, yes, fine, you know, of course, I write it. And then I write a paper, I say, and then publish it and so on. And then they say, oh, yeah, of course. And then they send you the paperwork. And the paperwork, it says, the data belongs to the German Soccer League, and so does the interpretation of the data. Oh. And so all they wanted was the Max Planck name, and say Max Planck says it's safe, but they made the interpretation. So, of course, I didn't sign any contract with the German Soccer League. The German government is not so much better, by the way, but uh, that's another story. Ask me about it. You know, we have a mask scandal in Germany. 
and, and so I was called upon to show that the masks that they bought were safe. And again, the interpretation of the data was not 100% up to me. Uh, so we didn't sign the contract. Okay, so let me let me go into this now. Here, why why didn't we why didn't I why it was I not able to move these aerosols so these little dust particles? Why was I not able to move them? When you look exactly at me, you see that. So I have a I have a mask which actually had one of these plastic things in the front where you can breathe out, but I I glued it so you can't breathe out. So it's just like your masks, and nothing, right? When you look here, nothing. Yeah. So so when you look at this video. There's nothing. And coughing. I mean, coughing is like a jet trying to come out, but nothing. You see the air rising, by the way, from my body, because this is a lecture hall. And the lecture hall is cold, clean air coming in from the bottom. And you're, you're buoyant. The air at your body is buoyant. So the cold air rises at my body. And I, that's why this blimp, this clear blimp is there, because there's no aerosols. But I could shout as long as I want. And now I'll show you what happens if I... Yeah. So you see here the chat going, because it was very loud. Three lines. You see coughing is really long distance, you know, six, seven, eight meters, no problem. Of course, we wanted to show that the lecture hall is completely safe, and so it wasn't quite that successful. Actually, it's quite safe as mosque. I, I will come to that. So you see that when you have, a, when you, when you are speaking or when you are, when you are, when you are coughing or when you are shouting, there's a strong fluid dynamic jet coming out of your, out of your mouth. Actually, it's very similar to the jet that comes out of your, your room fan. It's the same propagation that you have there. It's the same physics. The concentration in this jet decreases like one over the distance. Not like one over the distance squared, it's just one over the distance. That's because of the entrainment of the fluid on the side. And that's why it goes much further than you would think, because it mixes very, very poorly. And so what you can do then is you can, so I came, I will show in a moment how I got into this, but let me just show you some slides of well-known things that were very well known before the pandemic hit. Now, remember, when the pandemic came, you, it sounded like we know nothing about aerosols. We know nothing about the origin of droplets. Well, it's not true. This is from 2016. Well, that's a long time before the pandemic arrived. And this is a review paper. So this is a review paper reviewing the knowledge of human aerosols. And you just have to find them, and they exist. So, of course, the problem was that in the, late in the early 90s, all aerosol research around the world was being shut down because it was decided that we know everything. <laughs> no, really, it's true. In Germany, every professorship. So when the pandemic came, there was not one professor left that could say, I teach my students every week that we know a lot. But in industry, the students were still around, the people that make aerosol equipment. And so when you look at the literature, you find this. So there's three main mechanisms how we produce drops and aerosols. One of them you might have discovered yourself when you have a phone like this and you, you, you I, I do this a lot, I walk around and speak and speak and speak and then I says, and then I keep going. This is what happens, these are the big drops. Actually, this was the first experiment by Digweed in the 40s, that's how we measured the size of the droplets that come out of a mouth by just looking at a plate and then measuring with a microscope the size. By the way, we find no difference to his data. <laughs> we find exactly his data again. So perfect, uh, wonderful. I mean, what shall I say? Well done. Now, what you can do to avoid this is you take a lipstick, which is fatty, which doesn't allow the lips to wet. So the lips don't get or fatty because of that. The water doesn't get stuck, right? You can just like on your car when you put wax on it, the, the water runs off. The same thing you can do to your lips, and then you can try it. Five minutes, no drops. Six minutes, a little more drops. Ten minutes, you're back to ground zero. And so what that means is you can actually avoid these big drops just by putting all the time some lipstick on your lips. And then you get rid of the 1.5 meter rule. So they could have said we all have to put lipstick on our lips, and then we, we wouldn't have had the 1.5 meter rule. Um, 
So this is one mechanism. And this was very nicely demonstrated by Howard Stone from Princeton and his colleague of Karyan. They had a high-speed video camera. And whenever you say something like P or T or boop, this is what's happening. Now we don't see that because usually we don't have a high-speed video camera in, your, in, your, in our brain. We have just eyes that are very slow and you don't zoom in that much, right? So, so but if you take a high-speed video camera, I guarantee you everybody in this room has this property. Other than you have this labello, this in Germany is labello on the lips. And so what that means is these drops are generated. How do they get generated? Well, the first thing is this liquid wets the parts of your, of your lips. And then you pull it apart and this, this, this liquid is viscoelastic. Since it's viscoelastic, it makes these lines. And when it makes these lines, they burst. And these are the drops that fly out right now. I should, but you have a mask on, so you're safe from me. But, but this is what's happening. And I once in a while see one of my drops just flying through the, through the sunshine. But it's very rare. It, it turns out these drops are very small. So the biggest ones are half a millimeter. So they're pretty large if you think there could be viruses in the, a virion in it. So this is a lot of volume. Well, but this is one mechanism. I will get to this a little bit more. So this was also published in October 2020. It's, and this is really a new discovery. <laughs> so although, of course, here it was known, but it was not investigated to that quantitative level because the video cameras, of course, didn't exist. Then, of course, there's this mechanism which we know when we have a cough, you know, we try to cough out the mucus in our lung. And then we just go, and then it comes out. It's actually very benign. There's very little coming out through its sheer effect as, as we found out. And then there's a very interesting one, which is this one, the bronchial fluid rupture. So the drops, so here's a question. When are the very small aerosols produced in our lung? When we inhale or when we exhale? Produced, not given out. They come out when I exhale, but when are they made? Are they made on inhalation or exhalation? Who is for exhalation? Only me, okay, that's good, because all the others are against exhalation. It's inhalation is when you produce the, 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 the particles. And the reason is quite simple. So in, in our lungs, we have the bronchioles, which are the little pipes that go to the, to the air sacs where the air exchange is happening. And they're about a millimeter thick or thinner. And the, the whole lung is covered with airway lining fluid. This airway lining fluid is a very viscous, like saliva. It's full of proteins, as, as of course water, a little bit of salt, and here and there virus. And wait, possibly or not. And then when you exhale, your lung volume decreases, right? Because you're pressing out all that air. In that moment, these very thin, bronchioles close, they close all the way. And now you have in, in the air, you have this very viscous fluid, just like at the lips, and you pull suddenly when you inhale, you pull them apart, you make a, like a soap bubble, this or lines, the soap bubble explodes, and you have a lot of little particles in your lung, with it a few viruses perhaps or not, or bacteria. And then when you exhale, that is coming out. So it turns out when you stop your breath for 10 seconds, you can reduce the number of small aerosols by a factor of 10, just by holding your breath. That's which tells you that this is probably okay, this mechanism, because then these particles begin to settle in your lungs and then they don't come out. But none of us does that. We, we just like to breathe, right? Okay. So let's do this a little bit more. Uh, let's go to the next point. So one, one of the points, I just told you there's a fluid coming out of the lung. And in this fluid, there is here and there a virus or a virion or a bacterium or nothing. And now this particle is going into the room. Now I have to worry about relative humidity. I have to worry about does that particle that I put in the room evaporate and shrink and gets reduced in weight compared to the intensity in weight. It basically gets very, very small. Density goes up, but it gets very, very small. And then the turbulence keeps it airborne for a longer time. It turns out that 50 micron particles shrink to about 10 microns and then stay in the air forever, 30 minutes. 
that's 50 microns. So 10 microns will settle in about 30 minutes. At 300 nanometers, it just stays in the room forever. You can't get rid of it. And so what that means is you get these aerosols in the room. And so you need to know if you want to calculate somehow or you want to estimate how many virions are actually in this drop. You need to know the wet volume because the wet volume was the volume that decided that came from the lung in this mixture where a certain amount of virions. And the question is that determines the concentration of the virions that I exhale. And then, of course, things dry. And that also tells you what you have to. So this is how it looks, by the way, when you look at a so Jan Molacek, who came from MIT to me a long time ago, he did this experiment. He's a mathematician, by the way. And so what he did is he took a, a hair and he put a little bit of ABS surface fluid on it. We went from the hospital, we got some real, it's not saliva, it's actually real liquid out of the lung. And you put it there and you just let it dry. And then from that, you can measure how much this comes. And you can very quickly see that this is not a normal drop, right? This has all kinds of surface tension effects. It obviously is a gel. It's a hydrogel that's drying, but there's something left over, and it's not one virion. And so in Germany, they made the rule that we all have to buy HEPA filters. Because they said we have to, that was in Germany, that's the highest filtration value, because we have to filter one virion. It's 120 microns, 100 microns. Well, it's not true. All these viruses are encapsulated in some thick truck. So it's a huge truck and there's this tiny little virus sitting in. What I have to filter is the truck, not the virus. And so what that means is all the air filters that are surely used here in the Kavli Institute are probably good enough to get rid of. Well, we should look at them, but I'm, I'm pretty sure at least ours and our institute were good enough to have the quality that is high enough to filter these big particles, which are the ones that will carry the virus. Because a single virus virion, first of all, if this poor virion is all alone, it will dry, and when it dries, it uses its viral probability. It cannot multiply anymore. So it needs this hydro, this hydro shell. It needs to be encapsulated in something that has a little bit of water in it so that the virus stays active and can actually infect people. Otherwise, it would just die in the free air very quickly. And so what we have to filter now, what we have to find out is what size of particles and in what concentration come out of a human being. And if I know, that, then I can predict mathematically what is the probability of a transfection. How, how, how probable is it that you get infected because of me speaking? I can tell you, me and you with a mask, it's at least 30, 40 minutes if I, I breathe at you directly. So it's, 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 you're very safe. Um, and so we need to know what this is and we need to know the concentration. It's not good enough to know the relative concentration. We need to know the absolute concentration. And I said for every human being, well, you know, we have H. You know, here we are we have also quite mixed in H, but you know, I will tell you the older you are, the more aerosols you will give up uh, out. So I'm on the high aerosol side right now. Probably, most likely. Very systematic, by the way. Kids are much less. But adolescents, so so when you run through puberty, you're basically like a young adult. So it, suddenly there's a transition and then you are you have more aerosols. So schools are actually relatively safe places as long as the kids are not grown up. And if they don't speak. Um, so now the story is not done. And, and this is also very old. This is 2018. So this is long before Corona. And there's actually a beautiful work which I show you immediately. If I would like to know whether I get infected or could get infected by Corona by aerosols or drops that I know are in the room, I need to know how many of them get stuck where in the lung, right? Not all of them go in the nose. I mean, some go deep in the lung. You know about the PM5 particles, the particles that are smaller than five microns. These are the ones in China, which go really deep into the lung and cause a lot of health problems. So clearly it needs, you need to know what particles get stuck in the lung. And there's three effects. The first one is sedimentation. This is from half a micron to five micron, they just sediment out in the lung. Then there's the big fellows, they have inertial forces. It's like you have a big truck going around the corner, but you don't make it, so you run against the wall. That's this one. And then you have diffusion, so you just go around, blah, 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 and then suddenly whoop, you say, stuck. And so these are the three main mechanism for the lung, which also works, by the way, for your mask. Exactly these three mechanisms work for every mask. There's nothing new here. And the amazing thing is, this has been investigated to death. 
This is known extremely well by the ICRP publication, which is a joint worldwide initiative to figure out where radioactive material is settling out in the lung. I suspect this was because of the uranium mines, that they wanted to know how long can you work there before you, there's a lot of dust and you need to know. And so you know very, very well, it's all there and there's newer versions. There's, this is a five step one. So they have basically five levels. There's also one for seven, but it's very well investigated and very well done. And uh, so this is, uh, and this is one of these reports. And you know when, you see, this is when aerosols were in, still going at the end of the aerosol time for human aerosols. And so it's all there. So everything we need so far, you would think are there. We know where they are produced. We know where the, how they are, what the mechanisms are. We didn't know how much they shrink. We had to do some measurements to do that because the numbers in the literature said it's only a factor of two. A factor of 4.5 means that it shrinks much more in linear dimensions, so in diameter. And so we thought you will be done. Well, then you have seen this probably, and you know that there was the, you know, the, the, the six foot rule, I think it was six feet in the US, right? In Germany, it's 1.5 meters. And so everywhere it's something else. And then for a while, we, we were told that five microns are all aerosols and everything above five microns is not an aerosol. Well, it turns out this was the aerosol community was always shaking the head and said, what are you talking about? Anything above 100 microns is a, below 100 microns is an aerosol. 50 microns stays in the air. So where does the five microns come from? Well, there was one publication that said these small aerosols are five microns. And from then on, it was in the book. Everybody cited it and said it's five microns. There's a beautiful scientific American article which talks about how that number came into being. It, it, it's just there because people started to say this is what it is, but it doesn't really matter too much. Then microns is also fine, right? So, but the big guys basically fall down to the ground and then there's so-called formite rule. So, so if I touch here the, the surface and lick my hand then I could get sick, it turns out for Corona, that's very, very unimportant. So all this disinfections that we did is not that important. Um, but what's, was, what was very important, especially for the first variants. So the, the Delta variant or the original variant were aerosols that stay for a long time in the room. I think there is a, a real pointer here. Yeah, exactly. So these aerosols that stay then in the room, they dry. So the big guys fall to the floor. You have a ballistic trajectory, you know, parabola falls down. It's blown around by the wind. But in 1.5 meters, it's probably fallen to here and then you don't breathe it anymore. So it's fine. That's where this rule came from. This mask's relevant because there is no big droplets that I will show. And then of course, the little guys go in the room and this is why we shut down the KITP. This is why we shut down the universities. This is why you should be careful when you go in a not ventilated bathroom in a supermarket. If the bathroom smells, you shouldn't go into it. Really, I'm serious. <laughs> Because the aerosols from the person being in there might stay there forever. If you go in an elevator that smells, now yeah, you should take the stairs. Well, let the elevator come a few times so that the door opens a few times before you get in. So what we did in my institute, the first thing we did is we changed the elevators to be open when they are not used. It turns out it's completely legal, at least in Germany. I mean, I was afraid somebody steps in and falls down, right? I mean, but I guess when the door is open, so you step in, you also fall down. And so there's no rule. And so you can, the new elevators, you can tell them to stay open when they're not used. And then the elevators are always ventilated because by natural ventilation, and my guys in the institute came to me and said, well, what a wonderful thing now. It doesn't smell so strongly like pizza anymore. And, and I said, what a, what a nice thing. And so what you get is basically you have this transmission. You can inhale it when you inhale it. What's important is you have to inhale a certain dose. So we know that you need a dose of virions. Right now it's around 40 to 100 virions to get sick. With very, high, high, very high likelihood. And so what that means is you don't need many of these virions and you can go shopping. What I mean by that is it's over many hours. So you go there, you go there, you go there, and the body will say, oh, I'm not quite there yet at 50. Now I'm 50, now you could get sick, something like that. And so what that means is it's not a single encounter where you get infected, it's multiple encounters. And so that's why these rooms are so dangerous because you go in a room, 
You go in another room and slowly but steadily you get the dose which might which puts you in the into the position where you might get infected okay because of course you have an immune system and there's biology and all kinds of other things that happen okay so i'm going a little slow but i think i have to do it here and then i can speed up when i come to my own work um, and then you look at the literature and there's a very nice review by mira pelker who is an aerosol scientist and we are on it too and she's from Leipzig now. She's a young professor at Leipzig, at Leipzig at the Troposphere Institute. And what you can do is you can look at all the literature and then it gives little marks to the literature, right? You say, for example, red means some do not contain enough information to determine a reliable particle size distribution or concentration. This is red, uh, not really useful literature. Some measured on the uncontrolled conditions of your relative humidity and cleanliness of the room. Well, you shake your head and say, hmm, could be right, could be not right. Then you, yeah, it keeps going, right? And some measure the narrow range. Some have no direct concentration measurements at all. So you don't know anything about concentration, but you need concentration to calculate the dose. So it's useless for that case. Some used, I should say, not flawed instrument, but instruments that have very strong systematic errors. And the whole community has decided on one instrument that this is the best instrument to use and it has strong systematic effects. So you need multiple instruments to make a good measurement. And then some, the green ones, had less than 10 subjects, or we don't know how many people they even investigated. So only less than 10 people. Well, how could that be a good statistics? But it turns out it might actually be not so bad because we're also similar. And gender doesn't matter, age matters, gender doesn't matter, and BMI, so, you know, me being a little bit on the heavy side and somebody very thin, they would have the same aerosols, concentration. And some investigated only one activity. Of course, I would like to know what happens when I'm speaking here or whether I'm singing. Happy birthday to you. That's our song, by the way, that we used. Or whether I say, hmm, 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 you would say, what, Everhard, what are you doing? Why would you be humming? Well, it turns out that the small aerosols are exactly the same for humming as they are for singing. So in school summing, not a good idea. You might as well sing, okay? As long as you keep one and a half meter distance or you wear a mask, you should be really singing just as strongly as you can. No, no difference. Um, and then there's no concentration measurement at all. All these red ones have no concentration measurements for particles greater than 20 microns. And then there is basically there's almost nothing, nothing on children. Only recently, there were a few measurements on children, just recently, coming out in 2021. So there were no measurements on children, aerosols from children whatsoever, and we had to close schools and send them home, and we didn't know. We, I mean, the politicians did the right thing. I mean, if you don't know, you better be proactive and not let it get out of control. Okay. And, yes, go ahead. I will try explain it in a moment. Actually, the humming is coming from the focal cords. It's not the nose and it's not, it cannot be the mouse. So the big drop is all gone. So everything above five microns is just not there. I will show that. It's all coming from the focal cords and from deep in the lung. I mean, where does this come out? Well, it just comes out through the nose. I mean, yeah. it's all connected, you know. The respiratory tract is all connected and it's just coming out, but there's no tongue, there's no lips, there's no... So we did one experiment, I won't have time to show you, where we had people sing without using their tongue and their mouth. It sounds very funny, you know, if you sing, ha, he, ha, he, ha, he, and, and, and sure enough, the big particles are gone. And so we have also standards. We started out with standard texts and at the end we used, uh, for the English speaking people, we used, uh, what is it? Not watch it. Well, who's the rat? What is it? Uh, it's a children's story. Uh, right? No, it's, 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 it's the one rat that stays behind while all the other rats move out and then the building collapses and the poor guy dies. I don't know. Roger the rat or something. I forgot. Somebody will remember. Well, it's a very sad story, but I don't know why we choose it, but it has a lot of P's and T's and R's in it. And so that's why it's good. Good. Right. And so. Well, now I go to my science, okay? So now I'm leaving not the earth, but I'm going somewhere, I'm going very high up to the German Alps. I go to the Schneefanner house on the Zugspitze in Germany. It's a, for the US, it's not that high. It's only uh, 
what is it, uh, 8,000 feet, something, 2.6, 2,650 meters. And we do here cloud physics experiments as Ray can, he has been there, so he knows. And so we do cloud physics experiments on here, and we have here a fancy experiment that allows us to track cloud particles, droplets. And this thing looks like this. So there's a laser beam. The laser beam shines down on three cameras. There's three optical, there are three optical inlets where we image roughly here. And then we look at all these droplets that are in the cloud. And then we can not only measure their position as a function of time, so we can actually follow them in time. We can also measure the size. This is a very new accomplishment, which we are kind of proud of. And then we have a thing that drives with the wind. Of course, for Corona, you don't need that. And so this is the experiment right here. Here's a, here's a cloud. You see here the cloud droplets in there. And now we measure right here this volume with 15 to 20,000 pictures per second in 3D. And we measure also the size. This laser has 300 watts, so you have to be a little bit careful not to line somebody, but it works marvelously well. And so if you go to this, you can actually click on this and you get the paper where we show how to use this technique to this direct imaging. We actually really image in 3D and then calculate from the, from the basically out of focus effects, we can calculate the size, the knee scattering, we can calculate the size for the specialists. Well, then we have this toy. I don't know, David, have you seen this before? No? I guess I got this little toy before. You know, I have a kid, and kids love kites, right? And so, so you know, the older I get, the more childish I get. And so I got myself a kite. But if you have a kite, you don't want the kite to fall down, right? It always annoyed me when my kite I had to run to keep it up. So I filled it up with helium. No, I didn't. I mean, of course, you can buy this thing in, in England. It's called the Healy kite. And we have the biggest one around on Earth, as far as I know. This is 250 cubic meters of helium. It has a keel down here. If you lower that, there's a keel. And then when there's wind, it really flies like a kite. And if there's no wind, well, it doesn't fall down because we have helium. And what we do is we take this thing and we fly it into clouds. And we measure cloud droplets and aerosols and cloud dynamics right in the middle of the action. And so in February 2020, I was here. This is Barbados. Then I was here, then I was all the way down to the equator and I came back up here. So I was on a six week measurement campaign where we were driving around the Atlantic. There were four ships, a French ship, two German ships and an American ship. There were lots of airplanes. There were lots of drones. There was two of our kites. There was a lot of LIDAR, radar, anything. And it was all aimed at this region here which is the trade wind region, because in this trade wind region, if, you, if I would now give a, a talk on cloud physics, this, this trade wind region is very important for the climate of the earth, because if the clouds, they are changed, then the climate would change rapidly. And so the idea was to measure this very well. We were in the shadow of the Polarstein expedition where they had the ship in the ice. Remember, there was the ship that was frozen in the ice. And so we had two ships and they had only one, but they had the press and we got nothing, but it's okay. And so, so we had a lot of you still analyzing that data. And in my talk here, my scientific talk will be about results from this. And so how does that look? This is the transfer cruise from Montevideo to Las Palmas. This was the first time we tried out our kite. So there's our kite up here. This is the second one, little kite, which we use as a kite star, so to speak. It stabilizes the whole system. And then we fly 90 kilos of, mesh instrument, of, of instrumentation up into the cloud. And somebody had a drone and took a picture. So this was my first excursion it was just after my 60th birthday. I thought this was a very nice birthday present to see, to see Patagonia and then to go on a cruise. Uh, it's very exhausting, by the way. It's not a cruise you want to be on uh, for relaxation, I guarantee you. And, but it's amazing. It's really amazing. Okay, well, then we came back in Barbados. Remember, this was January, February. So we came back and we were told there's something called Corona. And so we came back and I was managing director. So the first thing I did is I said, keep calm and carry on. You notice, well, I don't have a mask, but this guy had a mask on very quickly. We have masks since the beginning. We took the clean room masks and distributed them immediately to everybody. And so far we had no infection. I'm singing, singing happy birthday here. We had no infection that we can trace to the Institute, not one. We have infections because of school kids going to school or parties. 
but none at the institute. I don't know how it's at the KIDP, but for us, because of MOSC, we didn't get anything, nil. And so the question was at the time, and there was a project in Stanford uh, to make a mask for hospitals. And diverse masks are amazing. I didn't know. I mean, somebody came to me and said, Everhart, don't you know about these great diverse masks? And I said, mm. and what they do is they have a separated, you know, remember the old ones where you had a little snorkel and you were breathing in your own air? That is now gone. You have valves. And the valves make sure when you always breathe fresh air. And it's very refreshing, actually, when it comes down over your face, when you're a little sweaty and it goes, oh, it's wonderful. And then you have the valve and then the air goes out. And what you can do is you can put two filters on the air, which are breathing filters for people. And then you can actually make a little clean room there. It's not a perfect clean room. A real clean room is cleaner. But it's a very good clean room for larger aerosols. So we said, well, why don't we measure aerosols? And so we had the instrument and we put a pipe here and of course a conducting pipe and I mean all the little tricks you have to play and we had a dryer and then we started measuring and then at the same time of course the question was how could our cloth masks and feed our fil filter mask and so and so on so we started like everybody else in the business and seeing which mask is good and how good it is but then we had this amazing mask here and then we said well now that we have such a nice way of measuring aerosols let's just use it on a lot of people but before I do this we also had this, this should be microns. The C, I don't know where the C is from. I have no idea. Um, strange. It's a really strange C2. Okay. So what we did, I showed you this experiment, right? And so it was Corona, right? So it was sitting in the lab. And I said, let's go down there and put on goggles and put something that you don't get burned when you put your face into the, you know, something that makes sure you don't hit anything. And then you go down in the lab and you just shout. Because when I shout, it's just droplets. And if we know droplets in clouds up from five microns upward, we should see them too. And so we did that. And so we had also, so that's subject number one, by the way. I was always subject number one. Not because I'm number one, I was really subject number one, okay? I, I was the one who started that was stuff. And then we were shouting in here, and then we had an awesome camera that would allow us just to take a, basically look at the droplets very, to make an image, not 3D. And so this is Mosen Bakeri here. He, he shouts goal, and I can tell you goal is much better than Tor. So the German Tor is really a spreading, high spreading event. So you're much safer in an American soccer stadium or a British one than you are in a German one. And you know, actually, I feel they have had the same shirt on. I just noticed so. <laughs> I don't know. No, it's not on purpose, okay? And so let's just look at once upon a time. Okay. Now, what you have to realize is this is the mouse. This is the nose of the subject. So the guy's turned. Of course, he was speaking like this, but for the imaging, we turned it upside down. So you see, this is done with this mirror camera. And these are the really big droplets. And so this is milliseconds, right? So this is one centimeter. This is milliseconds here that you see there. It's just once upon a time, and you can see immediately where things come from. Once upon, there's a big explosion straight out. Yeah, it's nothing. And T shooting down on the floor. Okay, and here you have the velocity, 10.9 meters per second is the highest velocity that we measured in this once upon a time. So the initial conditions, if you want to do any simulations, are pretty different from a jet. You have to really consider there these inertial effects of these particles flying out. And then what we can do is we can also analyze this. And this is when I gave a talk in Christmas time. This was nice yellow and looked like Christmas. So this is now just averaging a second, I don't know which activity, over time and putting everything on the, over, over itself as a stroboscope. So here you see one drop going pop. Pop, 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 pop. So it's like a stroboscopic picture, right? So you take one picture, next picture, next picture, and then you put them all on top of each other. And there you see how it looks like. So it's really pretty impressive. Oh, yes. Oh, there's very strong vorticity coming from, the, from your... So Howard Stonehouse is doing simulations of real teeth and a real tongue. And you get big vortices coming out of that. 
So it's not a chat, you know, a homogeneous chat. No, no, it's far from that. You have a lot of, actually, they see exactly this. We were, I just visited Princeton uh, in August, and they showed me the simulation, and now we're collaborating because we can give him the initial conditions for the simulations. And so, so this is pretty amazing because this tells you then how far they go and so on. So, but you see there's some very fast ones, there's slow ones. There's a lot of little stuff that's just swirling around. It dries very rapidly. And so this is the, and then this is how it then looks in full glory. So this is now 3D particle tracking. So this is about 7.5 centimeters by, so 15 centimeters this way, 15 this, 15 that. And then this is basically the velocity here, the 14.7 meters per second. And this is the particle size up to 64 microns. It's red. Some of the colors don't come out. So the big, the red ones are the big, big fellows and the other ones are smaller. So what we can do now is for every subject that we had, for a lot of subjects, we did this. And I will tell, so we investigated 135 people, which are in the paper. And since then we are up to 200 roughly. And so we wanted to get a good statistics and we also wanted to measure age. And so I wrote my first ethics antrag, uh, ethics application in my life. Where I had, and it turned out since I didn't collaborate with a medical doctor, but I, I had a medical doctor in the background who helped me, but I had to apply with Max Planck and they said, well, you know, we help you. And it was very quick. They, 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 they actually it was done in two days because we don't do anything. I mean, the people come in the clean room, they speak and we take pictures, right? I mean, what, what's supposed to happen? So the, the most, the most work was on the data statement in Europe. That's a big deal that you have, you can't identify the subject. So I shouldn't have told you that I'm S1 because you could identify me, um, but it was my choice, right? Oh, Arthur the Red, there it is. This was Arthur the Red. This is Arthur the Red here. <laughs> Arthur the Red, it's a British, uh, really? I don't know, it's, it's a British thing. Uh, it's a very nice story, actually, uh, interesting. And then, we had also the advantage of having a holography instrument. So this was direct imaging, but in clouds, what people do is, and Ray Shaw has done it also a lot, they have a holography system. So holography system, how it works is, you send light from here to here or from here to there, depending on how you set it up. And then you know you have a coherent light beam. You have seen these holograms, right? I, I assume you have seen holograms. And the idea is you have this very coherent light, this very special laser light. And when you have this very special laser light, you get a scattering, it scatters the light on the particles. And you get a mess when you take a picture. But when you take this picture and you project light through it, then you get back the hologram. You see what you took a picture of in 3D. Now, nowadays, you can do this on the computer. So you take a picture, and then you guess what the original object might have looked like. And it's very good. It's excellent. It's called inline holography. So we had that also. And that instrument also measures from 5 microns. And in this whole column here. So this is a column about this long this wide. And so what we did is we put it in the clean room and this is a professional singer. He just sings right now through the hologram. So it's not on the airplane, it's actually sitting in the clean room. And the nice thing is you need a very clean, clean room because you want to make sure that you don't measure the clean room, but you measure the people you measure. And so what we also have here is a, is a funnel. And with this funnel, we measure in addition the aerosols with the aerosol measurement device. And so this is a, <laughs> a picture of shouting Tor. And so this is the this, this beam that we have in the hologram. These are the particles. The particles here, there's one little red one, which is about here at about 85, 80, 90 microns. But most of them are much smaller. They're over here. And I made this line here to show you which particles will stay in the room and might infect you while they stay in the room as an aerosol, and which one of them will most likely fall down to the ground in the six feet. And so we have very well, we, we see what's coming out. We, we can measure this. We can not only measure this with a hologram, but we can measure the same person under the same activity also with the particle tracking. This way we have already two instruments measuring the same thing. Very good. Systematic errors, hard to beat because you make them everywhere. A systematic error, I don't know whether you know. A systematic error is when you get a result that you think is correct, but it's only because you did a certain systematic way of measuring it. That's a systematic error. So it's an error that you make, but they're hard to identify because they're systematic. <laughs> and so to avoid systematic errors, you better use, and each instrument has its own little systematic error. And that's why using multiple instruments measuring the same thing is very good because this way you might land in a sweet spot where you know what one instrument has its problems, where the other instrument has its problems. And so having this multimodal measurement technique is actually very useful. Okay. 
So we went to the clean room. This is subject number one. And this is uh, Mosen Bakeri, the group leader. This is an instrument that measures from 10 or 20 micrometer, uh, nanometers all the way up to 420 uh, nanometers. And then we have here the OPS, which is the TSI OPS. And when I say here something, you know, I had this diverse mask on, we take the aerosols through the dryer. This way we know we measure only dry aerosols because otherwise I get a mixture of wet and dry. I didn't want that. It turns out we are the first ones to actually dry the aerosols. The others just let them in the room and measure something, we think. And then we, we get all this and then we, we did this and then we said, let's just continue that for many people. So this is the this fancy diverse mask. I will explain this. So there's two designs, one breezes out through the bottom and the other one breezes out through the top. It doesn't really matter. And then there's this direct measurement with a funnel. And then there's here's the hologram and the particle tracking. So we have a very, very wide way of measuring things, wet or dry and so on, so on and mixing things. So we also went to the opera. And every time I play this, I get goosebumps. I was standing next to this American singer. And even with diverse moths, I can tell you when you're standing next to an opera singer, it's a different thing than being in the opera. Standing next to an opera singer is, and she was amazing. I mean, she would sing through this diverse mask and you, you heard her. This was just an iPhone camera, right? So this, it sounded professional. And, and she was very tired afterwards, she told me, but she actually sang the whole thing and we measured many different singers. And then we realized that these mosques are not totally leak tight. No gas mask is leak tight, okay? It's only leak tight when you push it to your face like you think you cannot stand it anymore. Then you might have a chance that it's leak tight. And so the very small aerosols will still go through. And so that's why we had to go to the clean room. And then we got the opera singers and singers in the clean room. And then we measured this. So now this is for the specialists only, uh, but I give you the gist of it as we, as one says. So this is the particle size from, this is uh, 10 microns, 10 to the one microns, 10 microns. This is then 100 microns and so on. So this is a logarithmic scale, okay? So down here we are at, what is that, 10 to the minus one, uh, 10, 10, 10 nanometers, 20 nanometers, just roughly here somewhere. Okay, so it's very small. So this is smaller than a, this is smaller than a virion. And this is much, much bigger than a virion. And that's speaking, uh, that's breathing. For a typical person, age 42. I will tell you why, <laughs> okay? But you notice there's a lot of small particles because of this closure, airway closure mechanism. And because you're breathing, doesn't matter, nose, mouth, doesn't matter, as long as you don't use the tongue, the particles fall down. Yes, great. This is wet diameter. So we have corrected all the data to be wet. So we multiplied all data that was dry by 4.5 and the wet stuff stayed wet. This is how we corrected all the data. So this is wet diameter. So when you think about it, why is it important? If you have a mask, everything you put out is wet because under your mask, there's 100% almost humidity. And so that means your mask on the exhale has to filter the wet stuff, which is good news because filtering bigger particles is easier than filtering smaller particles, right? And so the, that's why you have to decide wet or dry. You have to make something, right, to do that. And the mask, definitely wet is important. On exhale, on inhale, it's the opposite. On inhale, all these aerosols have dried in the room and now you want to put them back into the, into the mouth. It's, it turns out that a mask, actually no matter which mask, I will show this if I have, I'm a little long, so you just chase me out of here if you feel like I'm taking too much time. Is it still okay? Yes? Yeah, it's, it, then it's an aerosol. Before that, it's a drop, but it's, it was a drop aerosol, it doesn't really matter. It's, it's just something that stays in the air. Um, so typically they're dry. Um, or they are, you can also reactivate aerosols. So you can basically make out of them a cloud droplet, right? So first this is an aerosol and then it becomes a cloud droplet. If you actually put that aerosol where it's radiating here, are there dry aerosols in that? Oh, tons of them. So, so anything smaller than, so 100 microns is roughly the size of a boom in here. So half the size of a boom in here will dry in the air and stay in the room for about half an hour to 45 minutes. And that's why the small aerosols, that's why we have the air cleaners. That's why we have the air exchange. This is why we got infections in an elevator where there was nobody. 
because of these very small aerosols that just stay there. And then there is this path of the big guys, which are, by the way, much more likely to infect you because they have a much larger volume. And those ones are the ones that I now put in the room here, but you all wear masks, so you're safe from them. Oh, they, really oh, they I will show, they, they take, so the mask cuts off uh, here. So seven microns wet, every mask that we've measured, so we've measured medical masks and these K95 masks, even with a lot of leaks. So if I take this mask, I wanted to show this, so I show you now, since we are at it. So if I take this mask, right? So this is just, let's, let's take this one first. Okay, so this is a medical mask, right? So if I put on this medical mask and I, I really try myself very hard, which means I have to make a W up here and then put it on, then it's very leak tight up here. I put it on and then you think I'm very protected, right? So let me just disappoint you. Let's see whether I, you're protected from me, okay? So this is a non-cigarette, okay? This is just smoke, okay? I'm a non-smoker, actually a real non-smoker. I don't smoke, period. And I don't like smoke, but here I have to. So if I don't do anything, I'm smoking, okay? So let me just tune this up a little that I get a little more woof. Well, you saw one thing, nothing went straight. It all went to the side. So you're very well protected from the big, or, the big guys. And the stuff goes up. So all you produce is aerosols. So you don't, you're protected by these masks very well from the big guys. And the material is very good. Let me just show you that this material, this is the KITP mask, by the way. Not, I, I hope it's okay. I, <laughs> you noticed? It's almost perfect. Very good mask, by the way. So, no, no, <laughs> believe me, there are masks that don't do that. Uh, there are masks where you just see the smoke goes through like nothing. This is, by the way, the cheat man's aerosol detection device. If you want to know whether the mask works, cover it up. If you go in front of the mirror, if almost nothing comes out, the material here, which I will explain in a moment what it is, works marvelously well. If it doesn't, it smokes like mad. So let's see, this is a Göttingen mask, Max Planck mask, which I bought in China. <laughs> As managing director, I needed masks, so I just bought them in China. It's good to have postdocs in China. They help you, they actually send it to German conditions, which means no cash advance. I mean, my postdoc said, or he's a professor now said, well, I just sent them the money and then he, and I said, no, 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 and, and they, they still send it, it's amazing. Uh, but the, the shipping was almost as much as the most themselves. So this is now this KN95. It's a FFP2, but it doesn't really matter. It's they're all the same. So let's do first the material test, okay? No? Okay. <laughs> almost nothing, right? Very good filtration material. <laughs> Cigarette, always the worst. Oh, yeah, the first cigarette is always the worst, yes. And so now I have this mask on. Now let's see what happens. So what we did is, and I will come to this, what you can do since we are here, you take this mask out of the box, okay? And you just don't do anything. You just put it on. Now what will happen? I... It turns out seven micron and above particles don't go in or out, even with this breathing hole up here on the nose. In addition, it breathes really up here, so it goes into aerosols. So already very good protection, and it's a factor of 10 better in protection than this mask, at least on our six subjects that we measured. So even this mask just put on sloppily, now let's see whether I can do it right. So what I do is I make it flat, then I make it nice and round on the top because I want to make it leak tight here. Then I bend it up like a W. So it looks like this. Now you say, Ever is crazy. He makes a W, why would he do that? Well, the reason is this is a metal. And a metal, to bend a metal, you have to overstretch. Now here we only have bone. 
And I've tried very hard until I got a blue plot here to suppress my, it would never work. But if you pre-bend it, it's trivial because it's already bent and then you put it on, bend it down a little bit, it should be leak tight. So let's do a little test here, whether I'm a little better, okay? That's not that great, actually, I notice it, but. You noticed? Huge difference. Actually, another factor of 10. Just by doing this, you, you win a factor of 10. And then what you can do is you can put a little bit of 3M1509 tape, which mine is a little old, and put that up here, and then it's really leak tight. I don't, will not show it now, but you, you can, just working here will make a huge difference for your protection. And so why is that? So let's go back to our data. So here we have this breathing, so we can turn off the lights again, we are done. And then, so this is breathing, right? And notice here we have the ND log D of about 10, right? So it's just a number 10, just keep the number 10 in mind. Then use speaking normal, it shifts the curve just up, that's all. The shape stays exactly the same, but it's up. But now suddenly we have a second peak. Big guys, big guys coming in. Then, well, this is basically the seven micron limit. Then you have speaking loud, like me now. I'm loud, right? We call it uh, we call it stage speech. So you know, we told the kids to think they have to talk to the class, and then they speak very loud. So just up, but it's just a shift. That tells you that the mechanism here is probably all the same. It's just you use more of the same mechanism, and then. Whoa, the data collapses for the large particles. And then singing, shouting, everything. So here we have now speaking normal, speaking loud, singing, breathing. This is singing and this is shouting. So shouting, going to a sports game is really, or you have a party at home and people shout, make a Corona test before that. <laughs> okay, because this is really, but here, from here on, nothing happens. And the reason is that this is the mechanism coming from the mouth, from the oral cavity, from the teeth. This is very universal. It's always the same thing. And this data agrees with this measurement from the 40s. No wonder, because it's universal, right? So everybody seems to have the same thing. And then what you have is that we think that this part comes from the oral cavity. That's why it decreases by three orders of magnitude by a factor of a thousand for breathing. So breathing, if, we, if you sit here breathing, you're already very safe. You Right now, you wear the mask to be protected from me, mostly, because I'm the one speaking. Because I'm here, right? I'm speaking loud. I'm right here. I'm almost like singing. I could also sing. It doesn't make any difference. But if you just breathe, it's very low. Okay? And so now let me go through this very quickly because this is uh, – so we did age, right? So we started at about five, and this is all the measurements in color. And then we ended up at about 85. Down here, we have very few people. <laughs> and up here, we have very few people. Okay, we don't have, a, in, in between, of course, we have lots and lots of younger people. And so this is 135 people breathing, speaking normal and loud. And what we have done is we, 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 we asked ourselves, how much does age matter? So this is one here. So we normalized to this point and said, if it's one, this is the average data, that's one. Though no change with age, which turns out to be around 45. That's the average data. So if you take all the data, average it, it corresponds to a 45 year old person, men, male or female, doesn't matter. And then it decreases slowly, it actually changes by a factor of two. So it doubles during our adolescence. We grow up, we are adolescents, we have puberty passed, and then our aerosols and average increase by a factor of two during our lifetime. The small aerosols. And the kids are down here, but when kids are breathing, they have exactly the same concentration as adults. So this is for all the other activities, but not breathing. Breathing, you see, it's all roughly one. It goes up here a little bit for the, for the adults. That's well known because the closure mechanism is changing when you get older, but this is done. Okay, good. Well, then we made this application. You can click on it. It's aerosol.ds.mpg.de. If you have critique, just send it to me. We are fixing it right now. We are improving it. We also make one-on-one -on -one exposure now in this, into this app so that you can calculate if I'm at a party. Actually, it has a, we have a little page, which is like a, 
it's almost a little silly because we had to decide what's dangerous. And so we say, you go to a party and go to dinner, then invent it how loud it is and how many people are there. And then we calculate really out what is the likelihood of infection during a certain period of time. And so let me now go briefly to Moscow. You've seen this. So this is me doing my tests in the corridor. And this is this medical mask, which really breathes out on the side. By the way, you can, on the medical mask, you can work as hard as you want on the nose. You cannot get the side fixed. It just doesn't work. That's the only difference between this mask and that mask is this one is leak tight on the side. This one is not. But they're still very good, by the way. I mean, they're still protecting you a lot. So don't worry too much, okay? But these ones are a little better. And you can get better masks and worse masks uh, in terms of breathing. The newer masks are much better in breathe resistance. Uh, that's because the norm that we have is stupid. The norm in, in Europe requires this mask to be a filter of oils because it's a dust mask. And if you work at home in the dirt and you spray something, you want something that is good against oils. So what happens is the filter in there is called an electret, which is a charged polymer that gets plugged up and doesn't work anymore. And so they have to put in yet another layer of filtration to make sure it survives this oil test. But none of us is ever been, in oil, other than perhaps me right now with that stuff here, but nobody is actually, we don't want to fill the oil, we want to fill the human aerosols. And so we're wearing all the wrong mask. But K95 is similar. And so the test is wrong, and that's why the air resistance is so much higher than for these guys, because these guys don't have the oil filtration property. They only are supposed to hold back 10 micron particles, but by accident, the only good filter material that exists is an electrode, and so they use the same electrode, and that's why these things also work great for corona by accident. Okay, how does a mask look? I, who has cut open a mask? You should cut open a mask. Just take a scissors and just go for it. You should do it, it's fun. You, you discover the filter material, this electrode. And it, if the mask is new, it behaves in a very different way than any material you've ever had in your hands because it's charged. And so why would they charge it? I explain it in a moment. Well, because filtration works that way. So here, here you have the particle diameter. And as I said, at the, at, the, at the small part, the filtration is by diffusion. So the particles go there and just get stuck. The large particles are impaction. They just go hit the fiber and get stuck. And in between, you have the problem that the, the medium sized particles, 300 nanometers, neither diffusion works, so von der Waals, nor impaction. And that's when you measure outside aerosols, you will find a huge number of 300 nanometer aerosols on the outside, anywhere in the world, and at least in Göttingen, lots of it. And so what you needed to do is you had to come up with a filter that plugs this hole. And how do you plug that hole? You charge the fibers. And the charge is inside the polymer. So it's the same polymer as in a Coke bottle or a water bottle. And there's a special mixture of polymer. And that holds the charge very, very well. The only thing you should not do is dump it into isopropanol or alcohol because then the charge is gone. It's done in tests of filters, car filters. You just have to dump it into isopropanol to see how good the filter is when it's bad. And so don't put it into alcohol. And you shouldn't wash it preferentially. I mean, you, you lose about 20% on one wash cycle. So, so it's probably still okay when you wash it once, but I wouldn't do it. I would just buy a new mask. And so how does it work? As I said, you charge these fibers and then these particles which come in just get stuck on the fibers and you take out this intermediate sized particles. And what does that mean? Well, this is the distancing rule. So I wanted to explain to you again, all this part is being taken care of by the distancing rule. These are the big, big particles which are universally coming out. But if I wear a mask, all well, these guys are gone. Anyway, actually, it looks like this. Oops, where is it? I guess I, I messed up my slides. Uh, here, it looks like this. This is blocked by the masks. Everything greater than seven microns, wet or dry, is blocked by the masks. So by a medical mask, or FFP2, or K95 or medical, they all do the same thing. They don't let particles larger than, so even through the holes on the side, they don't pass through. So you have protected from the distancing rule. So 
Keeping every other chair open in the, in, the, in, in the theater, well, it's nice, you have more space, but it was not really necessary, in my opinion, because we by now we know that the moths take care of these large aerosols. And if everybody wears an FF, a mask that is formed like a KN95, then all of them blow the air to the top, then it's also okay. With a medical mask, perhaps not so good because the stuff comes out on the side and you might blow it all the time to your neighbor. So then you might have two meter, you know, meter 50 might not be so bad. And so let's do this again. Guys. So this is how much many aerosols of a given size would fit through a given mask measured on a person. And so here, this is a cloth mask. 80% of all aerosols of this size will go through the mask. So it's a non-filter. So then you put on a medical mask, actually a poor medical mask. This is better. <laughs> I have to say. Um, then you get this bump, and then you, you wear one of the KN95s, and you're already down here. But then we have to ask what of that stuff actually gets stuck in the lung. And so you do this ICRP model, and you notice it looks very different. Before I showed you this one, let me show it again. So if I show you this one, you say, oh, whoa, how terrible cloth masks are, right? But then you say, what of the, that the thing is the cloth mask has the whole of penetration exactly where your lung doesn't keep it. So if you take stuff in that comes out anyway, so why filter, right? So the cloth mask is actually not so bad, right? It's not so bad because the cloth mask is here, but you can see that the, the FFP2 or the KN95 is basically down in the, in the noise. And so that means you're really, really safe. Now you can make this a little bit, I'm getting to the end of the talk, so don't be afraid. I'm, I'll let you go in a second. What you, what you can ask yourself is the following, and we, we thought about this forever, and then Mosen Bakhtieri had the idea of doing this, this system where he says we have N is the number of aerosols coming out in a given size over uh, on a given activity for a given size in this over 20 minutes, okay, coming out with mask or without mask, okay, different mask. And so what that means here is there's 35 particles coming, basically 35. I think this is a uh, particle emission, yeah, over 20 minutes. So very few on this breathing. You see the numbers are not very high on the breathing. And then the question is, how many puzzle chain copies could be there when you assume the current variants of Omicron? And so that is 12. Without uh, red is with a surgical mask. Seven would be with a with a FFP2 and one if you have it well fitted. And then you go here for speaking, you know, and this is shouting. So shouting really is a big deal. But the good news is with a mask, oral cavity, the big guys. So this is the volume that would come out. These, these, these blobs that you see there corresponds to this volume here. It's large. So this is a huge volume, but the mask take it away completely. So this means that the big drops, I mean, Cumulative, right? We take all the drops of a given size, put them into one gigantic drop and say, how much would that drop be? That's these guys. And so what that means is masks work extremely well. And uh, what we then did is we, we calculate the upper bound for infection risk where this is a PNS paper in Proceedings of the National Academy, uh, which went around the world. I show you in a second. And what we did is we said, well adjusted KN95, both persons. And we took basically the, it's called upper bound. We try to figure out what is the biggest risk you could ever have. And so what I would be is would like David and I would take now this plastic thing over the head and then sit there for 20 minutes and breathe on each other. And so this was an upper bound, okay? So basically zero distance. And this is what we have done here. And you can see that the risk of infection for the different variants, this was Delta and this is Omicron. It has an ID 63 of 70 at that time. And it's very, very low over these 20 minutes, the probability to get infected with Delta Omicron. While if you then have a medical mask only for those people, then you're already up at 10.4% or 7.6% over the same period of time. So by wearing a well-fitted FFP2, you can reduce the risk enormously for K95. Yes? Well, actually, you look at the number, 70. You know why? It's very, David, you're, thank you, thank you, thank you. Omicron is only in the upper respiratory tract. Mostly in the upper, it's mostly in the upper respiratory tract. 
So we assume that the viral load for particles smaller than five microns is a factor of thousand less than it is for the upper respiratory tract. And so far it seems like it, and that's why this room is also very safe because the new variants, the newest variant is a little worse. So it goes again onto the lung, but the, the Omicron, I had the B variant, I, I didn't even get a cough. It was just a sore throat. And how do we know that? Because it's hamsters, right? We don't, for the humans, it's very hard to say where is it really located, but they did experiments on hamsters. And hamsters had only a PCR load up in the upper respiratory tract, but not in the lower. And that's why these numbers are lower. So Omicron is not so bad when you, when you wear a mask. So Omicron, I mean, although the ID 63.21, this is this one over one minus one over E is 70, you're, you're a lot slower. And Lars will kick me out in any moment now. So now I finish. So, so we also looked at music instruments and did the same thing. And we measured them all, you know, we measured all these music instruments and a lot of work, a lot of musicians, a lot of kids that would volunteer in our lab, um, a lot of corona observations, you know, at that time we already had tests, so we could actually, we were sure that nobody had corona when they came before we didn't. We just assumed that they are not sick, right? So we were wearing masks, so we should have been fine. And so we measured this, we can do the same plots. I didn't want to bore you about this, but I wanted to show you this. So this is now the relative volume concentration for different instruments. So this is piccolo trumpet, tenor horn, double horn. What's your daughter? Trombone. trombone. There it is, there's trombone, right? So this is the median for trombone. It's well below so in singing and well below speaking. So playing music instruments is a very safe thing. And all the aerosols are small. There's no big drops. There's none. The only one that's an outlier is this guy here, the clarinet. The clarinet can get in one occasion, in one measurement, actually reach singing, the average of singing. So music instruments, you can find this paper. It's, 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 it's published. You can find it. Playing music is actually very, very safe compared to a theater performance or an opera. And so with this, I closed. There were a lot of people involved here. So this is the troops. I activated a big part of my department from graduate students to postdocs uh, who are now gone. And then we had support from the University of Medicine Göttingen. And then we worked very closely with Tropos and the people from Mainz. So it was a huge, huge effort. I spent a lot of my budget of the institute on this. Uh, I think it's worthwhile. And then you get this and then when I look at this, I'm always happy. I didn't know something like altmetric existed. What is altmetric? It's an alternative metric for scientific publications, which looks at the online presence. So it checks not only out how many citations you have. So yesterday we had 30 citations on this paper, okay? Since December last year, it's not bad. But it also tells you how many tweeters you have, 25,000, 26,000. It tells you how many news outlets have published your story. And it tells you how many Wikipedia pages you have successfully achieved. We are, we are in the accomplishments in Wikipedia of the year 2021. Uh, how many Redditors, how many video uploaders, and then they cook up some numbers, okay? And I looked at this number a lot uh, because once you get into high numbers, so since the paper has come out, we have been number one in this rank in PNAS. So this is one out of three, 832. We have been number nine of all papers that's, that they have in their system, which is half a million since uh, 2000, since basically the paper came out and so and so on. And we are number three out of PNS. So this is very, very nice. And what I can tell you is this Twitter stuff is actually interesting. There's a lot of serious scientists on Twitter and they write very serious things. And you can start to communicate with them. You would never find them otherwise. You just read the Twitter tweets and then suddenly there's this scientist who works exactly in your field, who, who works a lot on masks or other things and you just don't know them and you send them a little tweet and then they come back and say, well, let's talk science. And so it's actually useful. I thought, what a, what a useless thing, but it's actually quite useful. Other than it's nice, you know, when I'm down, I pop this up and say, have I achieved 100, but probably never. And so this is what it looks like. And with this, I close. And I wanted to tell you, possibly later, if I get asked by Moss, could be better, but I did that already. We need 
desperately a good norm, a good standard for new mosques. Thank you. Okay, questions? Hi, I'm not sure that I conveyed my question clearly. So I believe that it works if you, the speaker, wear a mask, if that protects me. But I'm not convinced that that holds for us listening and you're not wearing a mask. Yes, it does. So, so the, in terms of, so there's the so-called outward protection and inward protection. In the outward protection, you have to filter wet particles, which are bigger. So the better mask, so here's a question, which mask do you have to wear if you want to protect other people, not yourself, but others? It turns out K95. Because the leakage is less, and because of that you put less in the room, and you, you protect people better. So Don, you're protecting people very well, then. You protect, that's really true. And on the inward protection, it's a two-way structure, right? The aerosol goes in the room, dries, and then goes back into, into the other body, and then they cause an infection. And if both wear a mask, this were these numbers I was showing here. Um, if, I, if I go to this plot here, where is it here? So the, if both wear a well-fitted FFP2, just make this bend up here that I did, just, just that bend, that's it. Then in 20 minutes, we suspect for Omicron or for Delta, it doesn't matter, it's less than a percent. For 20 minutes, you can't be in a person in a little cup. <laughs> where you inhale the air from the person all the time for 20 minutes, and the likelihood of getting infected according to the statistical model, right, or that you have a chance to get infected is about a tenth of a percent, or even less. It's very low. But when you do the same thing for two medical mosques, it's already 10%. But remember, the assumption is crazy. I mean, you and I will never go under a little thing and breathe the same air for 10 minutes. We would suffocate because of the CO2, right? And so, and then there's a room airflow and so on and so on. So all these numbers are completely overdoing things. But the nice thing about these numbers is it shows you what is the maximum, the, the worst case whatsoever that you can imagine. And so that means that if this is good, then in real life it will be much, much better. And that's why the upper bound, that's why this idea of writing a paper on the upper bound was so good because we, nobody attacks us. <laughs> no one. Because we are giving the upper bound. We don't saying this is this is the risk of of infection of transmission. Yes. Yeah, but, uh, if you if you had cloth mask on the same scale on this same. Risk yeah, it would factor. be somewhere twenty uh, percent something across the board. Yeah. Well, cloth masks are you know they they you can I mean you can see it here. Yeah. This is cloth mask, right? So the. So we are, we are worrying about here about particles from 50 microns downward. And you can see that there's a huge difference between FFP2 and class. So the 50 microns have the highest likelihood of having, so 50 microns wet is about 10 microns dry. And so, uh, but the mask, I mean, even the closed mask, I would expect to actually see here somewhere at seven microns probably. So it's a little unfair. So if you want to protect yourself with a closed mask from somebody else, then the, the, it's, the cloth mask will also be good of in fact getting out, but it will cut off here somewhere also. So we only have to worry about this part of the spectrum and not that part, so this was not quite correct. And, but you can still see there's factors of three, four, five, ten. And so the, 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 the K95 form, it's just the form by the way, it's not the material. And that's why if they, so I have a mask made, I talked to a company in Germany and they made a mask which is a medical mask it conforms to the Medigame mask standard, which has much higher requirements than the standard for K95. It has to be medically certified. This means no outgassing. This means the material has to be safe, blah, 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 blah. All that is not true for dust mask, at least not in Europe. And they, he made me a mask that looks just like this and is a Medigame mask. It conforms completely with the standard, but it has this shape and is completely safe. And because of that, he could reduce the, the filter to that of a medical mask, and now I have a KN95 that breathes really easily. I think he should have done even more, but he wanted to play it safe, so. Sure. Uh, how do you, uh, see, I'm trying to think. Now, how do you approximate or figure the dosage without poisoning the grad student? 
Uh, what was Ah, uh, okay, so how do you know the infectious dose? Um, so what people do is they make basically cell cultures. So it cannot be done by PCR. You actually have to make real bacteria, real, not bacteria, but cell plates, where you put on basically infected saliva or whatever, and then you measure basically how many plug formid units to get, and then you count it, and then you can calculate out what the... This is the, the, the parameter which is the hardest to get because we don't know how strong it is up here or down there. That's why I said in a hamster they can do that and can see, for example, just with, with the PCR, you know, polymer chain reaction, they can see how many PCR runs do you need in different parts of the respiratory tract, but you can't do that for humans because you cannot poke something down into the deep into the lung to get some sample, right? You could do it with aerosols, though. So if you do a fractionization on aerosols and then put them down, it should be possible to, if we are right, for the origin, this would be a way to say how deep actually the infection goes. That's why I'm saying there's lots and lots to be done. There will be much different masks in the next fifth, ten, ten, ten years. We will have much better masks and they will be tailored to the disease that's spreading. And not just a general purpose whatever thing. It will actually be, there will be five classes and you, the doctors will tell you, the government say today it's type three and then you buy type three and you're fine. And so this is what I would like to have, uh, that something like that exists, so that we don't overdo it, which we do. Right now, we're just overdoing things. Okay, yeah. on, on, on that note, I think I'm going to thank you, Eberhard, for a wonderful talk. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry.